Uh, it's on? Yep. Good. Is this thing on? Okay. Uh, Jeanette, thank you for that introduction. Yes, we go way back. I was fresh out of grad school uh, and applying for a position at the Center for Inquiry some, something like 15 years ago. And it was during that summer session where they used to have institute things uh, in Amherst and met Jeanette and we've, we hit it off then and we've, uh, it's been my pleasure to work closely with her and so many other people all these years since. I want to, uh, before I begin the talk proper, I just want to recognize Bridget Gaudette and her team. This is a fantastic conference, Bridget. Many of us here are veterans of conferences. We, you know, go to these conferences. Randy's been to, I think, uh, something like two trillion uh, over the years. And uh, uh, you'll hear uh, us talk about uh, the Randy Foundation's conference in Vegas every year. We know something about putting on conferences, and we've been to great conferences, and we've been to conferences that have challenges, right? And this is a great conference. So again, Bridget, kudos on what you pulled off. Kudos, kudos. As Jeanette said, I am president of the James Randy Educational Foundation. I'm in my fifth year now, uh, uh, starting my fifth year as president of the foundation. And uh, before I uh, get into uh, our conversation today about the values of truth telling and the relationship between skepticism and humanism and maybe how each is impoverished without the other, I want to do my duty as uh, CEO of the foundation and give you a very quick overview of the work that we do. Our mission is to educate the public about pseudoscience and the paranormal. It's, an, it's a limited mission. We don't uh, take on uh, every belief. We don't talk politics. Uh, we don't, uh, uh, you know, just look at uh, free, unfettered, critical inquiry into every area of human endeavor. Leave that to the center for inquiry, right? We have our blinders on, and we look at pseudoscience and the paranormal. Uh, so, very quick overview of what we do. When I came aboard uh, the JREF uh, four or five years ago, we started publishing ebooks uh, to reach new people uh, by distributing titles for the iPad, Kindle, and Nook. A lot of people read their books that way these days. And we've started publishing out of print titles, classics of skepticism, Houdini's. Uh, uh, um, book, uh, uh, n a number of his titles. Uh, um, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote a book on homeopathy. Uh, Mark Twain titles on skepticism. So we're coming out with these uh, books for new audiences. In addition, we've just published a uh, series of books on science-based medicine, 13 titles on uh, various topics in alternative, complementary and alternative medicine. And I'm happy to say we've come out with uh, all of Randy's titles for the iPad, Kindle, and Nook. And a bit of trivia, we sell more of those titles now, obviously, it stands to reason, than any of our other titles, but we're reaching people who didn't get his books uh, when they came out uh, a decade ago or a couple years ago or decades ago. Uh, we do more than just publish these uh, books. Um, we put on free regional workshops and trainings for grassroots groups across the United States. Uh, skeptic activism uh, trainings also at our event in Vegas every year. Uh, uh, Jeanette mentioned For Good Reason, my current interview show. I have to concede that I do really no work when it comes to the 250 episodes of Point of Inquiry or uh, the 75, 80 episodes of For Good Reason. I just get to have an interesting conversation, half an hour, with an interesting person about once a week when the show's going. My partner, Thomas Donnelly, is the audio engineer. He does all the magic, and he makes me sound a heck of a lot smarter than I really am. Uh, in addition, we support other podcasts, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. How many of you have heard of Skeptic's Guide to the Universe? We've uh, supported that uh, over the years. Uh, we also have put out a, a podcast called Consequence, Consequence, uh, which is about the harm that results from undue credulity. Interviews with people who have been scammed and what the experience was like and what you can learn from that experience. Uh, I'm really happy, Randy mentioned it in his talk, I'm really happy about our digital outreach online through our video channel on YouTube. It's one of the most subscribed channels for nonprofits in YouTube history. Uh, 
uh, millions and millions of views, something like seven million views. Uh, uh, Randy's videos are popular on there. We put all of the content from the amazing meeting online. We're sort of like the TED of skepticism. Uh, our great speakers uh, give their talks, and then we put that online for free. So if you haven't checked that out, go to youtube.com slash James Randy Foundation. Excellent content there. I mentioned the amazing meeting. It's the largest gathering of skeptics in the world. We had uh, a couple years ago, I think it was nearly 1,700 people showed up in Vegas for four days. Last year, almost that much. Uh, uh, it's really become, as I mentioned, the largest celebration of scientific skepticism. We're a relatively small nonprofit, yet we're able to put on this big event. And that's because of the kindness of really a lot of folks who work with us to put on TAM, the amazing meeting. Uh, it's obvious, it's called the amazing meeting because Randy is the amazing Randy, right? And we have uh, the world's leading intellectuals come uh, and present for us, and we all, always have a couple magicians for color. And uh, so Penn and Teller are part of the mix and many other people. Bill Nye speaks at our events, and uh, we, uh, that is Sarah Mayhew. She's an illustrator who uses skepticism in her manga, which is a sort of uh, Japanese style of comic books and reaching new people that way. Neil deGrasse Tyson, of course, has spoken at our events a, a couple times. He's a, a big favorite. Uh, Adam Savage from Mythbusters, big fan of Randy. Uh, you see how uh, people just flock to touch the hem of the garments of our speakers at the amazing <laughs> meeting. We also do amazing meetings at sea. So we call them amazing adventures. Our last one was last December, a Maya end of the world cruise, uh, exploring prophecy and uh, doomsday cults. Uh, Randy and I and a, a few speakers, Jennifer Michael Hecht, Ben Radford, uh, uh, spent a week with about 70 uh, folks in uh, the, throughout the Maya Riviera, uh, Honduras, uh, Mexico, a few other points, and uh, uh, we've done six of those so far, and we're due uh, to be announcing our next one shortly, so stay tuned to randy.org for information. Um, I want to tell you what this is all about. So, uh, does an educational foundation dress up like zombies? Well, we do, and here's why. Uh, Randy, for decades, has not just been someone, in fact, he really hasn't ever been someone, who hectors believers for their undue credulity. Instead, he puts the purveyors of nonsense on notice. And that's what the JREF does with the Million Dollar Paranormal Challenge. So there's a famous psychic, his name's James Von Prague. In Southern California, he was doing a weekend seminar to connect people with their dead loved ones. Part of this religion, this worldwide religion of spiritualism that cropped up around the Fox sisters, the turn of the uh, 20th century or late 19th century. And he's in that religious tradition, you'd say, religious tradition. And for exorbitant sums of money, he will talk to your dead loved ones. Well, he was doing a weekend seminar and we issued him a challenge. We said, prove that you're actually talking to dead people and we'll give you a million dollars. He ignored us. He ignored ABC News and other media when they asked him about our challenge. So we thought we would bring some dead people to him. <laughs> or, or should I say undead people. Uh, and uh, I also want to emphasize, we didn't go there to poke fun of believers. We didn't even engage with believers there. They were already inside. They'd paid their money. They were in their seats or their pews for the messages. We were there to engage James Von Prague and basically actually to do an action, to raise awareness in the national media. And I'm happy to say that our action got press uh, nationally in Forbes and other places. And we did a little viral video of the experience. Uh, I say viral because it sort of took off. A lot of people who really didn't know about the foundation were sharing this video and that's the way that we like to raise awareness as we advance our educational mission. Uh, so, use brains, psychics not real, uh, or, uh, uh, and, and here, here is the video, I want to share it with you. A 
Okay, so as most of you know, we're here tonight to shine the spotlight on James Von Prague, this celebrity psychic medium who says he can talk to dead people and that dead people talk back to him. <coughs> We say he's taking advantage of the bereaved. He's not helping people overcome their loss, but he's getting them stuck in their grief. So we at the James Randi Educational Foundation issued James Von Prague a million dollar challenge if he could just prove that his stuff is real. He won't take our calls. He won't talk to us. He won't talk to the media who have asked him about this. So if he won't talk to us and he won't talk to the media, we wonder if he won't talk to some dead people. He said he could talk to dead people. We brought some. He won't talk to us. I don't have I don't have access to him. If you'd like to talk to somebody, I can get somebody for you. But I think that would be fantastic. Appreciate that. Do you guys have we'll permission right to be here? Uh, we assumed we were invited because James Von Prague says he could talk to dead people. He hasn't responded to our million okay, dollar challenge. Okay, but do you challenge. have? I'm gonna have to ask you. Okay. James okay. Bond. Okay, guys. So, yeah, and he doesn't want our million dollars. So. Just one more quick comment on that. It was lighthearted, right? These are serious issues, but sometimes the best way to reach new folks who, not, who aren't already engaged on the topics is by puncturing the pretension of that undue credulity with comedy, and that's what this video was all about. And again, I emphasize uh, we weren't about making fun of believers. We were about putting James Von Prague on notice. I'll talk, hopefully, if I have some time, uh, at the end, I'll talk a bit more about James Von Prague. We've started coming out with resources for the classroom, free lesson plans, using the investigation of the paranormal for junior high and high school students to teach critical thinking. These are attached, these lesson plans, to national science content standards and AAAS science education standards. Notice one of these free lesson plans, it's do you have ESP? It is not entitled, there is no such thing as ESP. It's an open-ended question based on a, a book that Randy wrote for Dover uh, uh, years ago. Uh, it includes Zenner cards, those little cards with the three wavy lines and the star and the square and the, uh, the circle. Um, and it teaches students how to build a test to test if they have psychic powers. Uh, th through the process of which they learn statistical methods and about uh, investigator bias and they learn other principles of science but they're engaged because of this sort of spooky or interesting topic. Uh, Cottingly Fairies is a hoax uh, the uh, uh, early 20th century that Arthur Conan Doyle was bamboozled by. A couple girls in uh, Cottingly uh, said that they took pictures of genuine fairies in their backyard turned out to just be cardboard cutouts, early versions of Photoshop, early versions of trick photography, but it became a sensation. And we use the example of Cottingly Fairies to explore with students the role of celebrity in inculcating uh, silly beliefs. We talk about uh, 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 vaccine denialism and uh, uh, Jenny McCarthy. We connect the dots about celebrity and nonsense and uh, uh, we have a number of other lesson plans too. Dowsing seems sort of trivial. Dowsing, you know, is what your uh, uncle does in the backwoods of, uh, you know, in the Ozarks or whatever, where he's water witching or he's trying to find oil or 
gold or something back there. It seems trivial, but we make it relevant by using Randy's example. Look, it took a magician to expose that in uh, uh, Iraq, in the UK, and in the US, the three governments spent tens of millions of dollars recently to buy glorified dowsing rods for use at bomb checkpoints. And no one opened the gizmos up, right? It took Randy to break the thing open and discover not only were they not effective gizmos, they weren't even gizmos. They were uh, innards of remote controls sawed in half uh, with wires that didn't even connect anywhere, right? Uh, uh, James Mc, uh, McCormick, the charlatan who sold these to the U US government and the UK government and the government of Iraq, was recently, this is an example of when the good guys win, was recently convicted of fraud in the UK and has been sent to prison. But it was a very long time coming, and it's because of Randy exposing the fraud. So uh, this is relevant. This isn't about trivial beliefs. This is about life and death issues. I'm sad to say that it's not just at bomb checkpoints, but the government of Sri Lanka just bought a similar item for uh, finding missing persons at uh, disaster relief scenarios. The government of Mexico uses them at drug check checkpoints. Imagine the civil liberties implications if, you are, uh, if your vehicle is searched because someone is using a fake dowsing rod to see if there are drugs in your car. Uh, we have one on astrology. In addition, uh, uh, just a number of other of these free books for educators, and they're also great for homeschoolers. Uh, I want to emphasize that they're free and that all of them are available on randy.org, or if you're a teacher, we'll send you a packet of printed ones for your classroom. Of course, we put on the million dollar paranormal challenge. I concede that that is not the way science works. Science doesn't work by saying, Prove your hypothesis and we'll give you money. Uh, yes, there are grants involved, the National Science Foundation, et cetera. But this is a challenge. This is a way to, number one, educate the public about these irresponsible claims, and number two, put the claimants on notice. We basically say, if you could do what you say you could do, prove it. Put up or shut up. And we think when someone says, oh, I don't need no million dollars, we think that's sort of uh, an admission that they actually can't prove their abilities. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Randy has challenged so many celebrity psychics with a million dollars, and they often say, I'm a millionaire already. I don't need the million. Randy's response wisely is, then give it to charity. Okay? Win the million, prove your ability is real, it would change science as we know it, and you get to give a million dollars to charity. Still, none of them take us up on the offer. We make available grassroots resources for skeptics and humanist and atheist groups who want to work with us to advance skepticism in their neck of the woods, especially around uh, paranormal beliefs. So when Sylvia Brown, James Von Prague, John Edward, uh, the Long Island medium, Teresa Caputo, they all go on tours, high ticket, high ticket price tours, where they pretend to talk to dead people. We think they're pretending. We think they're knowing cheats and I can get into why uh, later. Well, we offer resources for activists who want to go to that event and educate people who are spending their money to talk to the dead loved ones. And none of this ridicules belief. Um, it puts the uh, charlatans on notice. And notice the real uh, resource here is you're grieving. You've lost someone. Uh, you're going to a psychic to get help, but uh, you can also get help from grief counselors. Here's some information uh, from the psychological sci sciences about the stages of grief. We think that uh, these, I'll say charlatans, get people stuck in their grief and actually keep people from healing. <clears throat> so uh, we also travel a lot. Randy travels a lot. Uh, he said that he hasn't uh, traveled for a couple months. He recently had surgery. But last year, what was it, R Randy? Spain, Italy, Germany, Australia, India, all over the world, all over the United States and Canada, giving talks, really uh, inspiring people to get off their duff, roll up their sleeves, uh, and work with us to advance skepticism at the local level. Uh, this is Randy in India. Uh, they did a really great backdrop for that. 
a little uh, uh, fun that way. This is uh, Randy uh, in Italy. He gave a talk at a theater that was simulcast to 30 other theaters throughout Italy. Uh, and uh, Randy's really uh, just given talks, sold out crowds. That's Northern Europe. I think that was Norway. Uh, this is Randy in Spain uh, doing a little uh, psychic powers. He, he, uh, he almost won the million that day. <laughs> so to frame our conversation, when I uh, want to talk about the intersection of skepticism and humanism and how each, I think, should inform the other, let's just ask the question. If you're going to consistently apply, uh, uh, let's say, science, the spirit of science to claims, what would it mean that you are? What are you if you consistently apply the spirit of science to claims? Well, it means that you're a skeptic. And so I think, if we're doing it right, everybody in this room is a skeptic. Yes, this is a humanist conference. But I think if we're doing it right, we're all skeptics. Bertrand Russell, I can't affect his high-pitched English accent, but he has this great line. It's undesirable to believe a proposition when there's no ground for supposing it true. But he goes on to say that this is paradoxical. It's even subversive, because if you consistently apply skepticism, it will necessarily undermine your most cherished beliefs. And not just God belief, but about ghosts. And maybe if you widely apply it about uh, the little God inside of us, free will, or the soul, or uh, I mean, there are really controversial claims uh, that will be undermined if you consistently apply the spirit of science. So what we care about is a belief in pseudoscience and the paranormal, and the majority of Americans believe in pseudoscience and the paranormal, by which I mean ESP and uh, telepathy, ghosts, Satan, uh, one of the, uh, what was it, um, Scalia recently talked about a, uh, a personality called the, like an actual person called the devil, he believes that. Uh, so. Uh, we, we're interested in casting a skeptical eye at these sorts of claims. And for us, skepticism is not naysaying. It's not cranky cynicism. It is a positive, constructive method. I talked about relevant real-world consequences regarding the dowsing and these other issues. And as I intimated a moment ago, I believe it should be, even if it's not always, it should be foundational to everything the larger community of reason does. Indeed, it should be the foundation of all of our work. Uh, that said, there's a necessary division of labor. I, I was at Center for Inquiry for 10 or 11 years, and Paul Kurtz, when he founded uh, that up, you know, one organization focused on religion, ethics, and society, another organization focused on pseudoscience and the paranormal, another organization on alternative medicine. Um, and that's just because uh, uh, the Big Ten approach works for people who want to be in the Big Tent, right? But there, there is such a thing as nuns who are skeptical of psychics, and they want to support the effort of debunking psychics, but they don't want you to talk about their god. And there are uh, folks who are really atheist, and they want to push atheism and fight the religious right, but don't take away their New Age beliefs or their belief in auras. And so to cast as wide a net as possible, uh, sometimes it's uh, necessary to have a division of labor. Atheism, for me, is just skepticism, but about one paranormal belief, one supernatural belief, the God belief. <clears throat> but uh, to tell you that I'm an atheist tells you nothing about anything else that I believe. It only tells you one lack of belief, right? So if I told you I'm a... a I don't believe in psychics. Uh, you would only know that I don't believe in psychics. You might be able to guess, well, maybe he's a naturalist, maybe he doesn't believe in the supernatural. But you know, uh, the Raelians are all atheists, uh, this cult called the Raelians. But they believe in UFOs, right? Or uh, Bill Maher is an atheist, but he believes in alternative medicine. Or Joe Rogan, one of my favorite comedians and, and a great uh, a radio show host. He's a, uh, a skeptic, an atheist, I mean, uh, but he is a conspiracy theorist about fluoride in the water and moon landing being a hoax and JFK assassination and, and other things. So to say that you're an atheist uh, only describes one lack of belief, and I'm for consistently applying skepticism widely. 
So it doesn't necessarily mean a thoroughgoing skepticism. And for that reason, hold your hats, atheists. I saw Dave Silverman just walk out. No, no, I'm joking, <laughs> joking. He did walk out, but for another reason. Uh, atheism is not enough. Atheism uh, is not uh, uh, rigorous enough. It's not satisfying enough for me. Not that I'm not an atheist. I'm a big damned atheist. I come out as an atheist almost as much as I come out as gay, right? But atheism is not enough. Humanism, as I'll frame it today, is skepticism about received and outmoded moral beliefs, right? It's a secular ethical approach uh, uh, to our place in the world. Uh, I believe that humanism can provide satisfying alternatives to received uh, moral beliefs. Uh, but let me suggest, certainly not in this audience, but that humanism uh, is on its own, in other words, without skepticism, I would argue it's not enough. And I say that as a devout humanist. But I've been to humanist conferences where at the banquet people talk about auras or chakras or Reiki or past lives. And not, you know, I don't, I'm not going to war with people about that because you're there about humanism and ethics. But uh, humanism, if it's without skepticism, is not enough. And so I just sort of drew some distinctions. And I think if you mush them all together and you say, we're all the same, uh, that gets messy and can actually create problems. I want us to be all of them, but I don't want us to mush them all together, right? I want to advance atheism and humanism and skepticism, even recognizing the distinctions. So skepticism is actually more than just naysaying. It's more than what you think it is. A lot of people say, oh, you're one of those skeptics, as if it's denying or just being cynical. But at the James Randi Educational Foundation, really using Randi and his decades of doing this as the model, uh, we see skepticism as open-minded, actually healthy. It's the best approach to claims. It doesn't say no to other people's nonsense beliefs. Instead, it's the best way to find out the truth. And in that sense, it's continuous with science. Uh, the, the Greek word from which we get skeptic is skeptikos, which does not mean to deny a belief. It means to find out, to inquire. And that's what skeptics are about. We're all about open-minded inquiry to get to the way things really are. In that sense, it's little more than ordinary common sense. Although you say that at a skeptics pub gathering and you'll have a skeptic say, well, it's not very ordinary and it's not common and it's not very sensical. OK, fine. Uh, but you know what I mean. If you're going to buy a car, a uh, used car, you lift the hood, you kick the tire, right? That's skepticism sort of broadly construed. I say, uh, if you're going to do that before you buy someone's used car, do it before you buy someone's belief. Lift the hood, kick the tire, see if it, if it works. Uh, that's skepticism. It's the application of reason and science, or the spirit of science, to any and all ideas. Now, before you say that's scientistic, that's why I use the phrase spirit of science. You know, the mood, the temperament of science, looking at evidence, evaluating claims. Doesn't mean beakers and test tubes, white lab coats, etc. The most important, I'll underscore most important, that's a strong claim for a tentative little skeptic. The most important aspect of skepticism for me is humility. People say, oh, you arrogant skeptics. I say quite the opposite. Skeptics are the ones who are the most humble. Uh, Andrean, one of my favorite writers in this area, Carl Sagan's wi widow, uh, emphasizing the humility of skepticism, says that skepticism is forever whispering in your ears that you're very new at this. You may be mistaken. You've been wrong before. That's the tentative message of skepticism. Not the thus saith, you know, where some authority gives us what to believe, right? But it's tentative and open-minded inquiry. Quickly then, what isn't skepticism? 
I hear some of my best friend atheists say, oh, you're just a Bigfoot skeptic, almost as a way to diminish the project of skepticism. Like, what I'm working on is the big kahuna, God, right? And you just care about Bigfoot or Loch Ness Monster or something like that? Well, in, I've done, I think, probably, I've done five or six onstage discussions with Richard Dawkins, and a couple times I asked him this exact question. Look, what's, what's more important? Uh, to be a skeptic, even if you believe in some sense of God, or to be an atheist, but not a skeptic, not a good critical thinker. And he's sort of of two minds on it. Sometimes he says, oh no, the, the big fight is, you know, the, the real harm results in belief in God. So let's go after God. Uh, everything else will work out almost like the Matthew 6.33 version of atheism. You know, the Matthew 6.33 is think ye first on the things of the kingdom of heaven. Everything else will be added unto you. Well, let's fight atheism. And, you know, who cares if uh, someone believes in the moon landing being a hoax or something. But other times, uh, Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris or others say, no, method is what's important. And th this is my position as well. Method of inquiry is what's important, not the content of your belief. There is no such thing for the skeptic as a statement of non-beliefs, right? We're not going to kick you out of the club if you believe in something you're not supposed to believe in. Indeed, at the amazing meeting every year, uh, we have folks who talk about diversity. We not only do, do we have racial and sexual diversity and age diversity, but we have diversity of ideology. My gosh, you have not had fun until you stayed up having a few drinks when the libertarians and the Marxists, who are all skeptics, end up having some great conversation. So uh, uh, we, we, uh, we think it's open-minded inquiry and you're not kicked out because of some doctrinaire non, uh, set of non-beliefs. So it's not just focused on UFOs, another big thing. So not just UFOs, psychics, and ghosts, it's also not a radical denial of all knowledge. In the academy, you'll get some folks who say that they're skeptics, and, and by that they mean they think that science is just one mythic narrative among many others. That science is no better or worse than religion or any other way of looking at things. You have philosophers of science argue, can we really say a rain dance doesn't cause it to rain. It, it might that actually just be a Western, patriarchal, uh, science, sort of white male version of reality? And aren't there other ways of looking at reality? Well, yes, there are. But uh, I don't think we need to imbue all of it with ideology. We could just look at the facts, look at, at the evidence, and follow the evidence where it leads. Uh, I was recently reading an article that's widely held as persuasive in some quarters of the academy that uh, posits Newtonian physics is male-centered because it's all about acting, right? What we really need is to replace Newtonian physics with something more fluid, fluid dynamics, like a feminine physics that's all about flow and, and uh, motion, et cetera. And it's so let's just call this a postmodernist critique of knowledge. And as skeptics, we say that's not really skepti skepticism. That's a sort of uh, epistemological nihilism. That says there's no truth, and we reject that. It's not do dogmatic. I sort of got into this earlier about the, the humility of skepticism. And now I want to talk about humanistic skepticism. That's why we're here. That's why I'm here. Randy, you saw in examples when he talked about why we do what we do as skeptics. It's not just to uh, belittle belief. You are not out there uh, uh, making fun of people who believe. Uh, we are advancing skepticism in the common interest. A good example is psychics. So I'm going to spend a couple minutes to talk about psychics. It's a good sort of uh, model or, or case study why skepticism has a humanistic core. I want to begin this little part of uh, the conversation just by admitting not all psychics are frauds. Doesn't mean any psychic is real. So I don't believe any psychic is real, but they're not all frauds. Uh, they might not be real, but they're not all frauds. Let me unpack that. There are uh, different kinds of psychics. There are storefront psychics that 
are largely, I'd say, fraudulent. These are the Romani psychics, the, what used to be called the gypsies, right? It's a subculture uh, where clans teach each generation methods of psychological manipulation to part the gullible from their money. But they're also new age psychics. You go to a, a psychic fair, uh, these folks might be very sincere. They come to uh, the world of psychic powers, not through the Romani culture, but through like crystals and chakras and all of this, really belief systems, new age cults or new age religion. Uh, there are folks who are shut eyes, that's what they're called uh, in this field. Shut eyes are people who shut their eyes to the truth that they're fake and they end up really believing it. And I know magicians, I know at least two magicians whom I believe sincerely believe now that they have psychic powers. They started out doing magic tricks, but they sort of fooled themselves. They got some hits among their clients and they ended up really convincing themselves, look, there are fake methods. I know those fake methods, but let me tell you this time that I gave a reading and I was so spot on, they get validation that convinces themselves. I think that's how a lot of psychics can sleep at night. They talk to clients who swear that they've been helped. And that validation is incredibly persuasive and self-deceptive. Then there are psychic entertainers. These are magicians who do magic tricks, knowing magic tricks, uh, but as psychic readings just to make an extra buck. So uh, I talked a little about the storefront psychics. I just want to uh, just qu quickly touch based on successes in this area. Storefront psychics, the Romani psychics, prey primarily on the grieving, on the hurting, on, uh, on people who are socially or emotionally disadvantaged. Uh, Rose Marks uh, in New York, Virginia, and Southern Florida, uh, the matriarch of a clan of psychics, was recently convicted, and she's going to prison for stealing get this, $25 million from her clients over recent years, and how does she do that? She says, uh, I'll help you with whatever your life's problems are, I'll remove a curse, etc." cetera. Uh, she was very creative. Uh, bring your money, because that's the problem, your money's cursed, bring $10,000 or $100,000 in cash, don't worry, you'll get it back the same day, bring it, uh, and I'll pray over it. And she used, it came out in court, other methods, magic trick methods. You bring a fresh egg from home, she'll remove a curse. When you crack it open, it's black and rotted and smells of sulfur. That's the evil uh, that has been removed from your life. These are old tried and true, tried and false uh, magic tricks that the Romani use. Uh, but it should be said that not all of her victims were victimized by these magic tricks. Some of them were just victimized by her pretense to expertise. People wanted advice. People had problems. And Rose Marks and her daughter and her granddaughter would give them advice. Should I sell the house? Should I leave my partner? My son has chemical addiction. What should I do about that? And the real offense in the Romani, the storefront psychics, is not that they're lying, but that they're taking people who are hurting and stealing from them not just their money, but their autonomy to deal with their problems. Rather than going to a financial planner about whether or not you should steal your house, uh, sell your house, you uh, go to a woman who has no background in finance. Rather than going to a family counselor when you have a problem with your uh, primary relationship, you go to some middle-aged woman who's just going to give you the same advice she'd give to anyone off the street. So uh, I talked a bit about how it works uh, because we're short on time and because I want to get to some questions. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, the main way that psychics do what they do is a constellation of manipulative psychic, uh, psychological techniques that's commonly called cold reading. It's actually many different methods that we call cold reading, but it generally goes by uh, saying vague generalities and becoming more specific based on the reaction of your sitter. Um, and the way the brain is hardwired, people getting readings often say very specific things about them in the course of an hour reading, and they just don't remember uh, the details that they give in readings. I will uh, just give one example, personal example, uh, uh, before I finish up. Uh, 
when I was a psychic. Now, I wasn't a bad psychic. I was what you'd call a psychic entertainer. But in my late teens and early 20s, I was a professional magician. And as a magician, you can't just make it by doing one kind of magic show. So I did a magic show called The Magic of God's Love, right? Because God's love, unlike magic, is no illusion. I did that for churches. I did a drug awareness magic show, a magic show, uh, The Magic of Reading for Libraries, and I did a psychic show. And I was hired uh, to do psychic readings or a psychic show at a man's retirement party back when McDonnell Douglas was McDonnell Douglas, not Boeing. And it was a small party, six people around a table. I showed up. I'm 19 years old, white turtleneck, silver blazer. I'm very serious. And I went by Daniel Joseph, right? I was wearing a little amulet, very quiet, not my normal self. And I sit down. First half of the show, I just do magic tricks. Suffice it to say, they looked like psychic powers, but they were just magic tricks. And then I took a break. I said, for the last half of the presentation, uh, I need to remove myself. I'm going to go into the other room. I need to meditate. I'm going to think about each of you and think about things that are going on in your lives. I'm going to use my five senses, create a sixth sense, and try to apply my ability to problems you might be facing or things going on in your life. And I went into the other room for 15 minutes the bathroom for 15 minutes. I didn't do anything. I just waited, sort of built suspense. And came out, sat down, and gave uh, sort of off-the-shelf readings that you learn uh, in, in this line of work. I looked at the woman who booked me, and I, this is a sort of uh, sped up version of the reading, but I looked at her and I said, uh, at work, uh, you, you work, at work there's an older man with dark hair, tall, a taller man. Oh, I see that there's a conflict, there's some issue, um, and there's going to be a change. So that's sort of general, right? But she was impressed, and she uh, said, oh my gosh, I don't get along with Frank or Bob or whatever his name is, the, the boss, and I'm moving departments. And everyone was impressed. And of course, I can't say, yay, that's a hit. Instead, I had to, like, in my all-knowing way, slowly nod. <laughs> and did some other readings, and the man sitting to my right uh, he had tattoos. They're all retirement age. He leaned back in his chair, sort of skeptical, and he said, all right, all right, fine. Tell me what happened to me today. And you can't really do much with that, right? The good thing about doing psychic readings, though, is that uh, you can be wrong and still be right. Because if psychic powers are a human ability, it almost lends to your credibility if you get it wrong a little. It doesn't seem like a magic trick, in other words. So I explained that, uh, uh, well, impressions are coming to my mind. I don't really know what these mean. You'll have to help me explain what they mean. I I'm seeing some images. Um, today, you learned of either a male or a female <laughs> that you haven't heard from in a very long time or you haven't yet met. And, you know, I was, I was planning sort of at that moment, I'd use this as an opportunity to make a joke and explain that this is all for entertainment, pass out my business card and hopefully get some new shows. But rather than him laughing and saying, oh, right, that's so vague, it applies to anyone, he paused and he was nudged by his wife sitting to his right and said, well, honey, tell him. And he said, my daughter called and she's pregnant, and we don't know if it's a boy or a girl, right? <laughs> and so everyone was impressed, and I saw immediately the appeal of this line of work. <laughs> so people fall for psychics because they're hurting. This audience, obviously, that I did these readings for, uh, they weren't hurting. They knew it was for entertainment. They called a telephone number on a flyer that was about shows. So I'm not going to show the best clip about psychics because we're running a little short on time. I'll show you maybe later. Oh, look at that. But was that manipulative enough? OK. So I mentioned James Von Prague earlier. Uh, not all great celebrity psychics are great all the time. James Von Prague appeared uh, last year, maybe uh, the year before, on Australian media giving psychic readings. And here's a clip where he does what I just talked about, cold reading, um, and try not to empathize with him too much. Don't feel too much sympathy for what you're about to see.
Well, we're back with medium James Van Prague, who has had us fascinated all morning about the, the world of ghosts and the unknown. And we're going to throw it open to you with our studio audience now. Take it away and okay. see what you can see. Okay, sweetheart, great. I'd like to start with this lady right here who's sitting right in the first row. Um, I have a mother figure very strong coming around you, okay? And uh, with the name of either Mary, Margaret, do you understand the name? Margaret Mary. Okay, Margaret Mary. And um, i got to tell you that I feel before she passes over, though, there's a lot of um, uh, it's a hard time to walk or a hard time to get up and get things going. Do you understand that? And, and also a hard time. She, did medicines before she passed? Um, well, she was on medication. But That's what I'm asking. She didn't okay. have any painkillers. Right, but there were med medications she took because I, I feel this very, very much before I, um, when she's coming in here. And I feel some arthritis, by the way. There's a lot of arthritis and there's a bone problem. There's also something with the back. So I don't know if she sees to sit and have a pillow with the back of her. No. Or is that you? No. No? That doesn't make sense to you? Okay. And what about trouble with legs? No. Okay. Who, okay. I, uh, who has trouble with the legs now? Well, my father's had two hip replacements. Two hip replacements. He can not walk as well as he used to. Oh, no. He walks very well. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> Right. Was your mother buried? Yes. Mm-hmm. Because she's talking about being buried and about oh, an awake, or a funeral, rather. And um, she knows about it. She was very surprised by it all. And who's Kathy? Or Kathy? Is there Catherine or Kathy? Kathy? Catherine or Kathy? Oh, she's talking about that. Kate. You know about this name? Well, Kate. One, Kate. One Katie. Of, yeah, who's one that? Of your I have a cousin now that's just... Um, just passing in Kate. Right now? I guess Come with me today, but um, she just had to have surgery. Let's talk about her, and she's praying with her, okay? I also know who's Catholic, but there's someone who's Catholic background. And, yeah, we um, all are. You all are, okay. Yeah. So there was a mass said for her, and she wants to thank you for a mass that was said, and there are prayer cards that are said. There's a picture of Mother Mary somewhere around. Picture of Mother Mary. Would you know about this? Do you know about this? Picture well, of Mother all Mary. Catholics have Mother Mary around somewhere. Good. <laughs> well, I know. You know. Um, <laughs> but of course, that was years ago. Um, <laughs> That's still good. But yeah. Nola's mother's name is Mary, and... Nola's mother died yeah. when Nola was only six. Oh, okay. okay. That was in 1950. Mm -hmm. Do you go backwards? I do go backwards. <laughs> I go backwards and sideways also. Um, so I want to talk about something else with you, though. Music, music, music. I don't know why about music. Did you not do music? Were you going to do music when you were younger and you stopped doing music? No. Okay, you never wanted to play the piano? No. Okay, who was that one to play the piano or music? Don't know. Don't know. No okay. one in my family's okay. musical. Um, I want to talk about this lady here. Your, father, your husband's passed over? Or your father's passed over, rather? My father. Father passed over. I don't know if he liked cars. Don't know anything about cars. But there's something about cars with him. I mean, he told me about this, okay? I don't know if he just recently got a car or there was talk about getting a car or changing a car. Are you are living or dead? Do you understand? <laughs> Do you know stuff about the cars? Um, no. Did not you just really. get a car or were there. No. No? No, no okay. for a couple of years. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Mm. Who had the heart problem? Um, oh, possibly my mum. Okay, yeah. okay. She's passed over as well? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know if there was a heart situation before she passes? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, and there was a situation sure. that she was going to either get an operation or a procedure done, something before that, okay? So I don't know if you know that, that she didn't get that. Um, I also want to ask, you know, who I'm with with Teresa or Terry, but I am. Okay, i got to tell you that. Um, I Sorry, also, what was you saying? Teresa or Terry. Teresa? Mm-hmm. Teresa or Terry. And um, was there a divorce with you? Never? You never married? No. Okay. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised because I want you to love yourself more. Because you don't. And I need you to love yourself more. Uh, okay? okay. Um, I also want you... There's something about the car here with your father. I don't know, but I'm talking about a car here. I don't know what it means. If you're just getting a new car, he got a new car, but there's something with that. Okay? I gotta tell you that. I'm gonna come over here to this lady. Are we almost closed? We're nearly there, just to see if you can feel anyone. Your husband passed over, correct? Do you have his ring or his watch also? Yes. Are you wearing it? Yes. Thank you. You just told me that in my head, okay? So you're very open. I want to talk about a picture that you had redone of him after he passed over, or you moved the, the paint, the picture of him, correct? Yes or yes. no? Yes. Okay. I also want to tell you that he's sitting right next to you on that. I don't know what you call the couch. Do you call it the couch or the seat sitte? But he's sitting there with you. He smoked cigarettes, did he? No, no, he's smoking the cigarettes. Are you smoking the cigarettes? Yes. Would you please stop? Because he's there in the settee with you smoking the cigarettes. He's smoking cigarettes, oh. cigarettes, cigarettes, okay? And um, I don't know who Paul is, or Paulie, or Paula. The name Paul. You understand that? Paula. Yes. Who is that, please? Uh, friends. Okay. He wants to say hello or thank you to them because they helped when he died. They were there. They were here. They were around. You don't know that. <laughs> James okay. Van Prague, please thank James Van Prague for asking some interesting questions. Thank you, thank you. Very, uh, very intriguing. Yes, thank people you. come tonight, they'll have a great experience.
So I talked about how they're pretend therapists, uh, poor man psychiatrists, but they're really unqualified grief counselors. And the real question you have to ask is, if, if you need help, do you want to go to a fake psychic or an expert in whatever area you need help with? Uh, we offer these resources I mentioned earlier. And the real point in all of this is that we do what we do not because we like to prove these nonsense peddlers full of it, full of nonsense, but because undue credulity hurts people and it's a humanistic motivation that we have to mitigate the harm of that undue credulity. In conclusion, I just want to give one example of, uh, really, from Randy's life. And I think this sums up the humanistic values of skepticism very well. When Randy was a teenager, well, he talked earlier about how his parents made him go to Sunday school, uh, but uh, he went to another church on his own, a spiritualist church in Toronto. And he knew a little about magic, and he realized the preacher, the pastor, uh, the spiritualist leader of the church. And in spiritualism, they don't give sermons. The, the church service is where the, the minister gives messages from the dead. That's the whole church service. Uh, and there are spiritualist uh, churches all over, even uh, here in Florida and Casadega. Uh, Randy noticed that this minister was doing an old magic trick. Uh, called uh, the one ahead, a, bi a billet trick where people would write down on pieces of paper questions and uh, the minister, w they'd be folded and the minister would take one and without looking at it, ask the spirit world uh, what the question was and he'd answer it for whoever wrote it. And it was very impressive. It seemed like there was real spirit communication, but it's a magic trick. And Randy knew that this scoundrel was doing a magic trick. And what was it? At 14, Randy busted up the church service, went to the podium, and exposed the minister doing the magic trick. You, you should know that he was promptly arrested. And he had to call his dad from the golf course to come pick him up out of jail. Uh, but why did he do that? Did he do it just because he wanted to like ruin a guy's magic trick? No, he did it because he knew the, the people in the pews were being lied to and it was hurting them. And the motivation that gets us to behave like that in the interest of other people is a humanistic motivation. That's why you can't have humanism without skepticism, and you can't have skepticism without humanism. You need both a tough mind and a tender heart. Indeed, skepticism is all about doing good by being right. Thank you. So, I. I think we're tight on time, so maybe just time for a couple questions. Any questions or, or thoughts or comments or uh, write in back. Uh, the question is remote viewing. Have we ever challenged the claims of remote viewing? We did and indeed recently. So Joe Rogan, I mentioned Joe Rogan, this comedian. He has a new show on Sci-Fi Network. Uh, called Joe Rogan Questions Everything. And though the man is a conspiracy theorist, believes the moon landing was a hoax, thinks fluoride is a government conspiracy to dumb us down so we're more easily controlled, uh, the show is actually good and skeptical because he's had skeptics on the show. And he did an episode on remote viewing and had me as a guest. So you asked that question just like we rehearsed. Good job. Uh, so, Remote viewing is a s sort of scientific sounding word for psychic powers. It's seeing things at a, at, at a distance. Uh, the other person that Joe Rogan had on as a guest is a guy named Paul H. Smith, who was actually employed by the CIA during the Stargate project, which was the government's official remote viewing project based on this idea that if the Russians really discovered psychic powers, it would be disadvantageous to our national interest. And that's true. So let's say there are 
real psychics in Russia during the Cold War, and they could discover uh, secrets, state secrets by doing remote viewing. So the government had a program where we trained our own psychic spies. Uri Geller, recently in a documentary, lied and said he was one of these. But uh, the government said, well, no, you weren't. You weren't involved at all. But Paul H. Smith was. He's a remote viewer. And uh, though the CIA eventually stopped the program and issued a big report, exhaustively reviewing all of their research, and said, well, we spent millions of dollars, and there's no evidence. All this time we looked at it, we have not found anything statistically significant to suggest that remote viewing is real. Paul H. Smith still trains people in remote viewing. So Joe Rogan had both of us on, and both of us were brought to the desert, and both of us were asked to demonstrate remote viewing. Now, Paul H. Smith used his psychic abilities, and I was, so, I was sequestered in a room, and I was supposed to just use sort of rational means to try to figure out the target location in the desert. Joe Rogan was trained by Paul H. Smith. I, I'm, I'm in the desert for, I mean, sorry, we're, we're in the desert all day, and I'm sequestered in a room. We get on ATVs, you know, these little dune buggies, um, after we each try to use our methods, and I write down what I think the target location is, and Paul H. Smith writes, uh, trains Joe Rogan to write down his location. And it's all on camera, and I'm being real jock-like and riding an ATV in the desert with a camera on me, and we get out, and the target location is an old abandoned gas station. I really wish I had uh, pictures of my uh, uh, results, but you'll read about it in Skeptic Magazine. So Joe Rogan, Paul Smith's training of remote viewing got one hit. He drew a box, a square, and wrote the word red. And sure enough, there was like a square with a red line in it as a design on one of the buildings. And they were very impressed by that. And Paul H. Smith, to his credit, said, well, we have to be very reluctant to try to, in a post hoc way, fashion the results of a remote viewing hit you know, to make it match uh, after the fact. And I was very impressed that he said that. And then they looked at my paper uh, with all of my uh, readings and etchings and stuff. And I, if you want to see me after, I'll show you a picture of, uh, that will be published in Skeptic Magazine. So I drew a picture of a gas pump. Uh, I wrote the words, overhang four posts but not four walls. And so that was the overhang of the gas station. I said, body of water, no, I X that out, liquid underground. Well, that's you know, where the gas would be underground. And I said, uh, powder blue structure. And I drew like some hash marks. And that, so on the site was uh, like an oil, one of those oil, whatever, you know, the, the, yeah, oil, Derek, or something like that, the, the powder blue. Um, and so Joe Rogan re looks at my paper and he s squeals and exclaims and, you know, I, I'm so glad I didn't write the words gas station because it would have been too on the nose and it would have seemed like a trick. So it's a little loosey-goosey. Paul Smith looked at it and he said on camera, well, I know you're not going to believe this, uh, Mr. Grothy, but uh, you have to allow for the possibility that you actually have psychic powers. <laughs> And Joe Rogan, you know, he knew that I'm a skeptic and, you know, trained by Randy and James Randy Educational Foundation pushes skepticism about these claims. And Joe Rogan looked at the uh, gas pump picture I did and Paul Smith said, well, that's obviously a gas pump. And Joe Rogan said, well, I don't know. Look, it could just be a crazy snake with a handle. Okay, fine. Uh, but the point is, yes, we've challenged it. And we're in discussion right now with Paul H. Smith, although I'm not super optimistic, that we'll be able to actually get him to the amazing meeting and do a test on stage of remote viewing for the Million Dollar Challenge. So uh, with that, I think uh, we'll leave it. Thank you very much. So again, Bridget, kudos on what you pulled off. Kudos, kudos. As
Jeanette said, I am president of the James Randi Educational Foundation. I'm in my fifth year now, uh, uh, starting my fifth year as president of the foundation. And uh, before I uh, get into uh, our conversation today about the values of truth telling and the relationship between skepticism and humanism and maybe how each is impoverished without the other, I want to do my duty as uh, CEO of the foundation and give you a very quick overview of the work that we do. Our mission is to educate the public about pseudoscience and the paranormal. It's, an, it's a limited mission. We don't uh, take on uh, every belief. We don't talk politics. Uh, we don't, uh, uh, you know, just look at uh, free, unfettered, critical inquiry into every area of human endeavor. Leave that to the center for inquiry, right? We have our blinders on, and we look at pseudoscience and the paranormal. Uh, so, very quick overview of what we do. When I came aboard uh, the JREF uh, four or five years ago, we started publishing ebooks uh, to reach new people uh, by distributing titles for the iPad, Kindle, and Nook. A lot of people read their books that way these days. And we've Uh, it's on? Yep. Good. Is this thing on? Okay. Uh, Jeanette, thank you for that introduction. Yes, we go way back. I was fresh out of grad school uh, and applying for a position at the Center for Inquiry some, something like 15 years ago. And it was during that summer session where they used to have institute things uh, in Amherst and met Jeanette and we've, we hit it off then and we've, uh, it's been my pleasure to work closely with her and so many other people all these years since. I want to, uh, before I begin the talk proper, I just want to recognize Bridget Gaudette and her team. This is a fantastic conference. Bridget. M many of us here are veterans of conferences. We, you know, go to these conferences. Randy's been to, I think, uh, something like two trillion uh, over the years. And uh, uh, you'll hear uh, us talk about uh, the Randy Foundation's conference in Vegas every year. We know something about putting on conferences, and we've been to great conferences, and we've been to conferences that have challenges, right? And this is a great conference, half an hour with an interesting person about once a week when the show's going. My partner, Thomas Donnelly, is the audio engineer. He does all the magic, and he makes me sound a heck of a lot smarter than I really am. Uh, in addition, we support other podcasts, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. How many of you have heard of Skeptic's Guide to the Universe? We've uh, supported that uh, over the years. Uh, we also have put out a, a podcast called Consequence, Consequence, uh, which is about the harm that results from undue credulity. Interviews with people who have been scammed and what the experience was like and what you can learn from that experience. Uh, I'm really happy, Randy mentioned it in his talk, I'm really happy about our digital outreach online through our video channel on YouTube. It's one of the most subscribed channels for nonprofits in YouTube history. Uh, uh, millions and millions of views, something like seven million views. Uh, uh, Randy's videos are popular on there. We put all of the content from the amazing meeting online. We're sort of like the TED of skepticism. Uh, our great speakers uh, give their talks and then we put that online for free. So if you haven't checked that out, go to youtube.com slash James Randy Foundation. Excellent content there. I mentioned the amazing meeting. It's the largest gathering of skeptics in started publishing out of print titles, classics of skepticism, Houdini's uh, uh, um, book, uh, uh, a number of his titles, uh, um, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote a book on homeopathy, uh, Mark Twain titles on skepticism. So we're coming out with these uh, books for new audiences. In addition, we've just published a uh, series of books on science-based medicine, 13 titles on uh, various topics in alternative, complementary and alternative medicine. And I'm happy to say we've come out with uh, all of Randy's titles for the iPad, Kindle, and Nook. And a bit of trivia, we sell more of those titles now, obviously, it stands to reason, than any of our other titles, but we're reaching people who 
didn't get his books uh, when they came out uh, a decade ago or a couple years ago or decades ago. Uh, we do more than just publish these uh, books. Um, we put on free regional workshops and trainings for grassroots groups across the United States. Uh, skeptic activism uh, trainings also at our event in Vegas every year. Uh, uh, Jeanette mentioned For Good Reason, my current interview show. I have to concede that I do really no work when it comes to the 250 episodes of Point of Inquiry or uh, the 75, 80 episodes of For Good Reason. I just get to have an interesting conversation with the world. We had uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was nearly 1,700 people showed up in Vegas for four days. Last year, almost that much. Uh, uh, it's really become, as I mentioned, the largest celebration of scientific skepticism. We're a relatively small nonprofit, yet we're able to put on this big event. And that's because of the kindness of really a lot of folks who work with us to put on TAM, the amazing meeting. Uh, it's obvious, it's called the amazing meeting because Randy is the amazing Randy, right? And we have uh, the world's leading intellectuals come uh, and present for us and we all, always have a couple magicians for color. And uh, so Penn and Teller are part of the mix and many other people. Bill Nye speaks at our events and uh, we, uh, that is Sarah Mayhew. She's an illustrator who uses skepticism in her manga, which is a sort of uh, Japanese style of comic books and reaching new people that way. Neil deGrasse Tyson, of course, has spoken at our events a, a couple times. He's a, a big favorite. Uh, Adam Savage from Mythbusters, big fan of Randy. Uh, you see how uh, people just flock to touch the hem of the garments of our speakers at the amazing <laughs> meeting. We also do amazing meetings at sea. So we call them amazing.